This is the CBS Radio Workshop. This is possibly one of the most lovely views. I thought it was good from Westminster Bridge, but I shall always now think that Big Ben has a very special one. I'm looking directly down on Westminster Bridge, over the Thames. I can see St. Paul's, and it is the perfect time of day, the end of the day, and the sun is shining, and everything looks pretty all right from up here. CBS Radio presents the CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, from England, the workshop presents Miss Sarah Churchill's Portrait of London. Daughter of one of the 20th century's greatest statesmen and former Prime Minister of Great Britain, Miss Churchill has established herself as a talented and sensitive actress in both America and England. Because of American interest in the great cities of Europe, we have asked Miss Churchill a question about her home. Recorded from London, here is her reply. You ask me, what does London mean to me? Well, it's the city in which I was born and have lived for more than half of my life. Even though now I am a wanderer and perhaps should be able to take a detached view of it, I can't. Whenever I return to London, I am simply coming home. However, since you have started me thinking, whenever London is mentioned, or the chimes of Big Ben ring out from a newsreel or radio, I see a large city, mostly gray in color, except for the vivid splashes of green when the parks are in leaf or bloom. So when I think of London, perhaps it is the parks that flash most quickly through my mind. Perhaps this is because I was a child here and spent many happy hours playing in them. I've always felt that London had a very special tempo of her own. Somewhere in a football crowd or a racing crowd or in the hubble bubble of Covent Garden Market in the early morning or in Petticoat Lane with its vendors on a Sunday morning or in the stock exchange with its brokers and jobbers or in the House of Commons with its debates. Among all these sounds and rhythms of London, I feel a steady pulse as reassuring as a heartbeat. Well, we've got a wonderful day for going around London. I thought we'd start with the zoo. It's quite early in the morning, so there's nobody here, but I wanted to pay a visit to my father's pet lion, which was given to him by the Lion Club of America in Chicago. He's quite a young lion, and here is somebody who can tell me much more about it. It's one of his keepers. His name is Mr. Swain. Mr. Swain, uh, is Rusty nice? Does he have any particular characteristics? Well, Rusty is very nervous at the moment. Rusty's very young. And, uh, as you see, he goes at the back of the cage when he got the stroke in. Yes. Well, well I, that was very alarming. <laughs> But he's not too bad at the moment. He may grow out of it. You think so? Yes. How soon must you stop treating them as pets? I mean, when they're quite small, you can pick them up. I mean, I can see you couldn't pick him up now. No. <laughs> but um, that's one thing you can't say. You mean they, they, they develop characteristics like people? They may get better or worse. That's right. <laughs> yes, that's very correct. He's all right as it goes for a youngster. Rusty, I think you're very nice. Rusty? Rusty? <laughs> Thank you. Well, he, uh, I think he's giving me a wonderful smile. Goodbye, Rusty. Well, we're just passing a cage with some birds called Quaker parakeets, which are simply enormous, and they make quite a lot of noise. It must be because we're walking by. Incidentally, People think that it's foggy in London. They should be here today because it's really quite hot and we're sitting on the grass taking a rest before we take you along to Buckingham Palace. Mr. Gregory, 
Would you tell me something about the London Zoo and what you do here? I have been employed here on the bird section for over 30 years. Of course, we reckon it's the best zoo in the British Isles, naturally, because we work here. It holds a royal charter, and it's a, a great favourite with all the people in London. We have huge crowds here on bank holidays, and I think they all appreciate they have the value for their money. Mr Gregory, how long has this zoo been in existence? Our zoo, London Zoo, has the Royal Charter. The correct name is, is the Zoological Society of London. Mm -hmm. The first charter was granted in 1828. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for showing me Rusty. Goodbye now. Thank you. It is a pleasure to have you. Thank you. They're changing guard in Buckingham Palace. Christopher Robin went down with Alice. A. a. Milne's poem for his son revives for all London children the continuing delight of watching the guards change outside Buckingham Palace. You know, I can't believe that there is a Londoner who does not as he passes Buckingham Palace on foot, bicycle, by cab or car, who, who does not shoot a glance up to the flagpole atop of Buckingham Palace to see whether the Queen is at home. This you can tell by seeing whether the Royal Standard is flying. It is today flying in a strong, fresh breeze, so we know that the Queen is at home. When a Londoner sees this, London becomes just that much more of a home to him. And when the flag is down, we all of us wonder where she is, how she is, and if all goes well with her and hers. We're standing at the foot of the Queen Victoria monument, just meters take across from Buckingham Palace. There's a very nice fountain that splashes about. Hey, the policeman will make you get down off there. Do you mean a cop? <laughs> well, yes, I mean a cop. Do you live in London? I live in London, Melbury Road. Oh, Kensington. oh, in Kensington. Oh, yes, I know that. I didn't know Melbury Road. Well. Maybe he'll let you stay. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> the guards are in their full summer dress of scarlet tunic, blue trousers, and bearskin cap. And the, and the horse guards, the, the household cavalry guard, they, they have the plumed helmets and the burnished breastplates and the white buckskin breeches, long black riding boots. Well, there must be, I suppose, some 2,000 people here, but don't think that they're all tourists. <laughs> More than half of them are Londoners who like to come again and again to see this particular pageant. Well, now I think we should go down into the heart of London, which is the city, past St. Paul, way down, and go to a rather strange market now, this is a market that runs just for about four hours during a Sunday morning, and it's called Petticoat Lane. It is oh, principally a market for clothes. Perhaps that's why it's called Petticoat Lane. I don't know, but it's about 11 o'clock in the morning, and if we hurry, we'll get there before it closes at midday. This is the famous Petticoat Lane in London, where you can buy anything. You can buy a puppy dog, you can buy jellied eels. <laughs> I just noticed a stand that is selling very nice little statues of my papa puffing away at a cigar. I, I simply have to go and look at those. How much are these ashtrays of Sir Winston? Uh, the ashtrays are two shillings. Oh, and how about the little statues? The small ones are one shilling, complete with three cigars. You place, in each model, you see, there's a hole by the side of his mouth. You place the imitation cigar in and light it up with either a cigarette lighter or a box of matches. I'll show you how it's done. There you are. And before you can say Jack Robinson, there he is, puffing and smoking. Well, now we'll take a walk down Petticoat Lane and let the market speak for itself. What colour do you want, dear? 
What colour? White. No, they're all with coloured borders, then. I'll take anyone. Um... You take, you'll take anyone. Thank you very much, sir. The man who is talking in the background is, is trying to sell things to a large crowd like you do at an auction, and he's waiting around for bidders, and as I'm holding a microphone, I'm, I might have to buy it, so I'm moving on now. Nobody got one. All right, then, if you haven't got one, I'll use one of those. As long as you're satisfied, they're all right, and that's all that really matters. Thank you, Forty-two, madam. Let me tell you, mate. 42, they're sold at 39 and 11 in the shops. See, I'm doing it for 30, Bob. Well, it, this really is an amazing street. You can buy anything, as I said. The, the clothes are, are, are very nice, and you can get... Oh, oh, I saw some Western clothes being sold there. Oh, did you know that all the David Crockett uh, hats are having a tremendous success in England? <laughs> and I have a confession to make. I've never been here before. London still has a certain amount of horse traffic. Some of the milk carts and coal carts are still drawn by ponies or horses. Here comes a vendor with a very sweet shaggy pony, like a little baby cart horse, and I think if we ask him, he'll give us a nice cry. What, what are you selling? I'm buying, ma'am. Any old rag iron buckles today. Buying. Oh, I see. You're any buying, old, yes. Any old, any old young. Mr. But Churchill's my friend. He is? Yeah, he knows me, knows me very well. I'm always down here every day, ma'am. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Hey. St. James's Street is composed of some very old and beautiful 18th century houses. They all have the high, spacious rooms, and the entire street really consists of clubs, men's clubs. Now, these form a very important part in the Englishman's life. Uh, you've heard that his home is his fortress. Well, th even that isn't enough for him. He has to have a place to get away from the women, and so he goes to his club, famous clubs such as Boodles, White's, Brooks, Bath, Pratt and the Conservative Club, they're all in the same street. Now, I can't go inside, so I found an English friend who is going to take my American friend in. But first I want to ask him, uh, Tony, would you tell me, how, how did the clubs originate, really? Well, in the 18th century, groups of friends used to meet in coffee houses to drink coffee and tea and chocolate, which were rather exotic drinks in those days. And uh, gradually they became rather a closed circle and the people who went there used to frown on those they didn't know coming in, and they used to meet there to bet. It was a sort of betting shop as much as anything. But now, what did they bet on? Well, mainly on horses and, and sporting events, but also on every sort of thing, political as well. One of the bets I recall was a bet that in 182, that in three months' time, Mr. Pitt would no longer be in office. But uh, there were all... Uh, how do you know this? Well, they, they keep a betting book. They kept one in those days, which listed all the bets and if they are paid or not. And, um, well, another one, one of the famous, more fantastic bets, Mr. Fox and his friends, sitting in Brooks's on a rainy afternoon, betted a fortune on raindrops coming down the window, one against the other, which would reach the bottom first. That's wonderful. Uh, now, I shall wait out here, and if you would take Mr. Rogers and um, show him the club, I will be very grateful. Yes, let's go in. We're fighting our way through London traffic. If you think you have traffic problems in New York, come and spend some time sitting here. I think perhaps the London taxi cab is a very important part of London, too. They're, they're all the same. They're little black Austins. They're not like your gay colored convertibles that you have in America. The color in our cars really comes from the great red double-deck buses. The, the traffic is moving a bit now. Uh, of course, today it's a little worse than usual because this is the rehearsal for Trooping the Color, which, as you know, is what we do to celebrate the Queen's birthday. It doesn't matter when a monarch has his birthday, uh, they make an official day of it, and we hold it in summer because, as you know, in summer in England it never rains. Here in the press section, on a day that 
they're holding the rehearsal for the trooping of the column. Uh, the, the stands are packed with tourists, and it's lucky that there are so many rehearsals because the parade ground is really very small, and this gives people a chance to see what is perhaps one of the most moving and beautiful military pageants, miniature military pageant. This is really what is exceptional about it because the Horse Guards Parade isn't very big and so you have a great feeling of intimacy. You really see, it's like a little arena and you can... Now we have some wonderful names. We, we have the Mounted Band of the Royal Horse Guards, known as the Blues, Grenadier Guards, Coldstream Guards, Scots Guards, Irish Guards, Welsh Guards. The music you're hearing to, they're doing a slow march of it's a mass bands, drums and pipes and and they march across, and then they double back through themselves. And they wear the red tunic, and of course the famous bear skins. And they really do look like toy soldiers from here. The precision is absolutely clockwork. Yesterday was a wonderful day, bright and sunny. Uh, today, of course, it is raining. Up go the umbrellas. I'm crouching under one. The colors are now being presented at this moment. And then, of course, they march the colors round the whole square, and as they pass, as you do, everybody stands up and the men remove their hats. The rain is now settling in. Lucky it's not great big drops. It's a sort of, well, I guess, being British, I'll call it a scotch mist that is descending. And people who don't have um, umbrellas are putting newspapers over their heads and handkerchiefs. <laughs> but nothing will dry them away. Well, I've been listening to the people talking in the crowd, and I found another American. I get to ask him what he thinks about it. Excuse me, are you enjoying it? Very much. I think it's the most amazing thing I've ever seen before in my life. Does it always rain like this in England? <laughs> no. Despite the fact that it's now pouring. Oh, we did? Oh. Good news has just been brought. We left our raincoats in the car. The car is about half a mile away because naturally uh, they have to shut the streets to traffic. So I suppose we just have to get wet. Oh, the, the color is now being trooped. report a, just a rustle of agitation in the crowd because it is now absolutely pelting down and um, the press are leaving <laughs> they have to because of the their cameras really cannot work without shelter in this rain although one man is doing his best he's completely draped in his Macintosh I don't know what he thinks he's doing under there <laughs> well um, Laurie is or trucks, as you would call them, have arrived with the Macintosh, Macintoshes for the guards. <laughs> so now we shall have the wonderful sight of seeing them all put their Macintoshes on. Raincoats, sorry. <laughs> this, of course, if this was really the show, they would just have to go on and get wet. But as it's a rehearsal, the practicability and sense has taken its place, and they, the, oh yes, and the horse, the, the lifeguards are trotting back and away. And, and, and at a pretty smart canter. Oh, no, this is all the king's horses and all the king's men. It's wonderful. Look at them galloping up. Do you see? Look. Oh, they're having a time of their lives. They must wait a long time, but they're allowed, actually, to go into a, a smart canter up the mall and hurry to their barracks. Well, now we are losing our bright colors. This appears to have gone too far, even for us.
We're standing now in the pit or the well of Big Ben. We're going to make a journey up. There isn't an elevator or a lift, and we're going to have to do it on our feet. So we're pausing at the bottom while we look up and see uh, the height that we have to go. Now, this is quite an experience for me because the outside of the building is very familiar, but I have never been here before, and I'm, I'm, I'm longing to go up to here. As I've said before, the chimes of Big Ben are known all over the world, uh, both to foreigners and to Londoners. But I wanted to do something special for my American friends, which is to hear the pulse of a clock. Now, without more ado, we're going to start a long way up. Well, it's um, really getting towards the end of the day, and we're on our way up, and we've run into some important people who have to do with the whole part of keeping restored the Houses of Parliament. <laughs> There's also a lot to do with the clock, and I will let them identify themselves. Uh, would you tell me what you do here? Uh, well, my name is Mr. Moore, and uh, we're working on the steel plates. My name is Mr. Charles Payne. We're doing the painting up here now. Would you explain me what the steel plates works does? Well, it's it's all repainting, like, you know, but yes. um, we've had to take the rust off the old plates, and now we're recoating them. Uh, would you tell me what you do here? Well, I don't know what I can tell you. You've almost heard everything what we can tell you. We're all on the same job. Mm -hmm. And uh, right. my name's Mr. Horrigan. Is it a continuous job? Of, well, of it will be until uh, it's finished. Uh-huh. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, now we're going to go right to the top and hear the clock. Well, we finally made it. And now I, speaking as a Londoner, born and bred, am standing in a place I never thought I would be, which is in the clock room. And I'm sure you could hear the pulse, which is what we have been looking for. To be technical, it's, it's a, a two-second beat. The machinery is incredibly simple. I, I expect one thinks after times and days and minutes and seconds, one's going to have the most fabulous amount of wheels. But actually, on the whole, it, it is rather a simple form of mechanism. It's a little too big for your own mantelpiece, however. This is the great clock of Westminster, to use its correct title, is a famous timepiece. It's a relay throughout the world because of its accuracy. And the accuracy is brought about by adding penny weights to the pendulum to compensate for the weather conditions. <laughs> That is absolutely amazing. They really are pennies. That was just the half hour being struck. Now, we only have one thing left to do before we go down from the tower, and that is actually to visit Big Ben himself in person. You see, Big Ben isn't the tower. Big Ben is the bell that lives in the tower. And so we're going to see him before we go. Uh, there's a nice story about it. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Butler, who, who really knows it. The story, as I understand it, is that a debate took place in the House of Commons to decide on the naming of, big, uh, naming of the Great Bell. And the first commissioner of works at that time who was responsible for the debate was a man of very large stature, known as Big Ben. And one of the backbenchers called out, why not call it Big Ben? And there was a great deal of laughter, and the debate then came to an end and the bell has been known from that time onwards as Big Ben. Well, we've now left the clock tower, and we have gone up, and we are visiting Big Ben in person. This, of course, is an open tower. We were in enclosed spaces before, but once again now, we are out like really in 
just the ordinary battlements of a castle. Mr. Butler will tell you his actual dimensions, but I can assure you for myself, he is big. Uh, big Ben is approximately nine feet in diameter and weighs over 13 tons. Well, when it first arrived at the Palace of Westminster, it was hoisted onto a temporary platform for the purpose of testing, and a very heavy clapper was used which cracked the bell. So the bell today has not a correct musical note. This is possibly one of the most lovely views. I thought it was good from Westminster Bridge, but I shall always now think that Big Ben has a very special one. I'm looking directly down on Westminster Bridge, over the Thames. I can see St. Paul's, and it is the perfect time of day, the end of the day, and the sun is shining. You remember earlier, we were seeing two people of color, and there was a downpour of rain. But now you see it's all cleared away, and everything looks pretty all right from up here. Well, I'm back home again now, and that was really quite a day. From my window, I can see that the light atop of Big Ben has gone out. Well, this means that the House of Commons has finished for the day, and the members are beginning to go home. Now, the constable walks through the vaulted corridors that are outside the chamber and calls... Who goes home? Who goes home? Who goes home? Who goes home? This dates from the early days of our parliament when the House of Commons was situated in quite a, a rough district. And the members used to go home in parties together because it wasn't safe to go alone. And to this day, around Barclay Square, you can still see where they would hang these flaming torches after they delivered the members of parliament safely home. Well, because you asked me, you've reminded me of quite a few things that I really do think of when I hear London mentioned. And I suppose that really the tangible thing that springs to my mind when it is mentioned is the same to a foreigner. I think that there they are now. The chimes of Big Ben alone express very simply what London is for me. And I would like to quote to you a sentence that became very famous and daring to us all in the war from one of your own commentators, Edward Morrow. This is London. Well, this is still London and what London means to me. From London, you have heard the CBS Radio Workshop, recorded by Miss Sarah Churchill. The CBS Radio Workshop is produced in Hollywood by William N. Robeson. Next week, from New York, the Workshop presents Star Boy, or The Legend of the Two Morning Stars, a tale of the Blackfoot Indians. This is Hugh Douglas speaking. Kachaturian's Violin Concerto, performed by David Ostreich at Norway's Bergen Festival of Music, Drama, and Folklore, is just one of the highlights of this Sunday's program on World Music Festivals. Be sure you're listening on Sunday when World Music Festivals comes your way on most of these same stations. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed on most of these stations by My Son Jeep. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network.